I'm always amazed by the interest in, this, in the Civil War. And would you believe that there have been 50,000 books written on the Civil War? That's one for every 10 soldiers killed. Civil War medicine, of course, is a very minor topic. There are only about 30 books on it. But uh, I, I think it's important uh, to take a look at this because from what we see on TV, uh, just is not true. There are two major fallacies about the Civil War, uh, Civil War medicine. One is that uh, amputations were performed without a good reason, and secondly, that they were performed without anesthesia. More about these two subjects a little later. As you travel around the country, you'll see a lot of monuments to Civil War people, the politicians, generals, soldiers, sailors, etc. But you will not see a single monument to a Civil War physician. And yet, there were 53 surgeons killed in battle during the Civil War. 284 died from disease. Many physicians, both Union and Confederate, stayed with their patients when their positions were overrun. Dr. Mary Walker, a Civil War physician, was the only woman in the history of the United States to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, she was honored by a postage stamp in 1982. She worked as a Union Army nurse because no one would hire her as a physician. Eventually, she did obtain a contract uh, uh, as a contract physician. And during that time, she performed yeoman service. She attended uh, Union and Confederate uh, soldiers. Uh, because she was a physician, she was enabled to allow to pass through the lines. She also acted as a spy and brought back information uh, to the uh, Union. Eventually, uh, she was uh, appointed as, a, uh, uh, as a, an assistant uh, surgeon. At the uh, end of the war, um, she was awarded the Congressional Medal. After the war, the criteria for the medal were uh, reviewed and we decided that they were being given out too easily. In fact, at one time it was even possible to buy one. Eventually she was asked to return her medal. And she said, you can have it back over my dead body. <laughs> she died the next day. <laughs> that was on February 21st, 1919. But in 1977, the medal was officially reinstated. Let's go back 140 some years to the earth to the eve of the Civil War. Moses Wisner from Pontiac is the governor of the state of Michigan. When war is declared, he will form the 22nd Michigan Infantry and lead it down into Kentucky, where he will die from typhoid. Typhoid will also kill Willie Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln's youngest son. Typhoid will also uh, kill Bell Starr, the glamorous Southern spy. It will also kill John Buford, who obtained the high ground for the Union at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, you can visit the Wisner Estate today. It's in Pontiac, just off M59. He is buried next to Israel B. Richardson, the hero of, of, uh, of Antietam. The grave site is in the Oakland Cemetery off M59, just as it enters Pontiac. The grave site has a small brass saluting cannon. It did two months ago. Thieves are trying to break it loose and to steal it and the cemetery does absolutely nothing to protect it. Charles Scribner from Utica at age 33 had two children. He joined the Michigan 22nd Infantry, died from measles. Uh, Dallas Tennant, great uncle of Donna Wills from the Will and Schwarzkopf funeral home, will join the Pennsylvania uh, Cavalry. Uh, he will be shot in the head and die in Virginia. These are the proportions of fatalities. There are Two people die of disease for everyone who died from a wound. There were three million soldiers, there were 600,000 deaths, 400,000 from illness, and 200,000 uh, from, uh, from wounds. Today, with our present population, that would be three million fatalities. My great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, John Butel, was a farmer in Clinton Township. He had a farm about a mile from here. Uh, he enlisted in the 22nd Infantry as a private. He was wounded at Chickamauga, and later on at the end of the war was discharged as a private. He established a military tradition for incompetence in our family, which has persisted through four generations. In Vienna, Austria at that time, there were two lying-in hospitals. A lying-in hospital is a maternity hospital. One is staffed by midwives and one by physicians. The midwives have a mortality rate of 2%. 
the physicians have a mortality rate of 20%. And the reason for that is that the physicians also did autopsies. They did not wash their hands, did not wash their instruments. Ignace Semmelweis discovered, noted, that if instruments were washed and if hands were washed, it reduced the mortality rate down to 2%. Nobody paid any attention to it. The next year, he announced this to the medical profession, and he was laughed at. No one paid any attention. Pasteur will not announce any of his discoveries until 1870. Lister will start washing his instruments in the chlorine solution in 1865. Late in the war, Dr. Edmund Andrews, a University of Michigan graduate and a surgeon in the 1st Illinois Light Artillery, will recommend that no probes or other instruments that have been used used in a case of gangrene um, should be used on any other patient and no sponge that is used on one wound should be used on another. He also recommended the instruments be thoroughly cleaned by washing and then dipping in water. Uh, he came so close to the discovery of bacteriology and eternal fame but missed it and no one has ever heard from him since. At that time in 1860, there were 41st class medical schools. We had one, the University of Michigan. Had a faculty of seven, approximately 150 students. Harvard had about the same number. In spite of having been invented 30 years previously, Harvard doesn't have a single stethoscope. Neither does the University of Michigan or a microscope. Both of these, however, were owned by members of the faculty and were demonstrated to the students. The course of medicine at that time was two years consisted of a series of lectures. Same lectures were repeated the following year. Some preceptorships were available during the uh, course or afterwards. Uh, many physicians, something like a thousand, went to the University of Paris, which was probably the top medical school in the country. Germany had a medical school which lasted four years. Uh, during the war, uh, uh, surgical amputations and anesthesia were demonstrated to the doctors. But while they were in school, in spite of the discovery of ether and chloroform, most students would never see an operation. Entering students were told, 50% of what we will teach you is true, 50% is not. Unfortunately, we cannot tell you which is which. <laughs> Another story from a later time, and probably apocryphal, is a professor of medicine who is teaching his students. He says, gentlemen, there weren't any female medical students at that time. He said, sooner or later, you will be called on to attend an unconscious patient. He'll be surrounded by a crowd of people wondering who you are and what you're going to do. While you're trying to decide what you're going to do and trying to get your thoughts together, I would suggest that you catheterize him. Catheterize him? Well, yes. First, it will do him no harm. Second, it might do him some good. And third, it's a hell of a crowd pleaser. <laughs> okay. At the outbreak of the war, there was a Surgeon General, Colonel Lawson. He was aged 80. At that time, promotion was based purely on seniority. There was no age limit. There were 30 surgeons and 83 assistants. But with the outbreak of the war, three surgeons and 21 assistants will go south. Eventually, there will be 12,000 physicians in the service of the armies. Many are appointed by the federal government, but volunteer regiments will hire their own. As you can imagine, qualifications were rather haphazard. Unfortunately, there were many incompetents. The battlefield will soon identify these and they will be dismissed. The general quality of the surgeons will be good, considering the times and the level of medical education. Surgeons are given the rank of major with a pay of $165 a month. Assistants will be lieutenants or captains with a pay of $100 to $130. There were no promotions, and this causes many problems as there is no chain of command. At the close of his Valley Campaign, Stonewall Jackson will recommend that surgeons be declared as neutrals. This will be approved by the Union in 1862 and by the Confederacy a few days later. And the first major battle of the Civil War is Bull Run or First Manassas. That's a disaster in many ways. There was no, am ar no Army ambulance service. The few ambulances were usually used by officers to carry their personal baggage. Wagon masters were hired. When the Union retreat became a route, they made a swift departure. Not one casualty from Bull Run was brought back to Washington by ambulance. One man with an amputated arm walked back 30 miles. Another, shot through both buttocks and the scrotum, walked the same, 30 miles. 
Now check at Manassas, after three days there were still 3,000 men still lying in the field. Clara Barton formed an ambulance service and brought her own private ambulances to the battlefield. By the time of Antietam, which was on September 7, 1862, there will be an amazing improvement. Antietam will be the bloodiest day in American history. There will be 25,000 casualties in one day. There will be 10,000 Union wounded. All of these will be off the field within 24 hours. This will not be true throughout the war, as many times there is no truce to collect the wounded. During the Battle of the Wilderness, many wounded were caught in fires when the woods, when the woods caught fire and died of burdens. Other, in other battles, the wounded were left lying in the field for several days because there was no troops. This gave them lots of time to bleed to death or develop gangrene. An ambulance service will eventually be formed by under the direction of Dr. Letterman. Uh, today, one of our primary military hospitals is named after him. There will be a uniformity of supplies carried in the ambulances. Even in the heat of battle, the surgeons can always locate chloroform, chloroform and other needed supplies. Common illnesses at that time are, unfortunately, typhoid. Typhoid has been with us for a long time. During the Crusades, it killed the King of France. It, as I say, it mentioned it uh, killed uh, Abraham Lincoln's youngest son. Youngest son. We still have about 8,000 cases a year in Africa, 4,000 in Europe. In the United States, we have 500 cases of typhoid every year, usually in immigrants. It's a disease of poor sanitation and a lack of hygiene. Like many infections, it's now becoming drug resistant. In the Civil War, typhoid caused 27,000 deaths, second only to diarrhea, which caused 37. Uncle Joe Stalin correctly said, one death is a tragedy, 10,000 are a statistic. Typhoid causes a temperature of 104 degrees, lasts the course of several weeks, has a mortality rate of up to 20%. It often has a rose-colored rash, but one of the bad things about typhoid is that there is a 3% carrier rate. That is, people who are not sick and maybe have possibly never been sick can spread the infection to other people. It's carried in the urine and primarily in the stools. The most famous carrier of all time was Typhoid Mary Mallon. In 1906, she was hired as a nurse by several wealthy families. She gave typhoid to several members of this family and there were several deaths. Eventually, she was identified. And even though she had done nothing wrong, she was confined to a cottage on hospital grounds in the Bronx for many years. Smallpox has got two viruses, variola major with a mortality rate of 20%, variola minor with a mortality of 1%. Abraham Lincoln had the latter. During the war, he was always besieged by people wanting jobs. And he finally quipped, he said, finally I have something I can give to everybody and nobody wants it. <laughs> Edward Jenner will uh, notice that milkmaids who contract cowpox are immune to smallpox, and he will develop vaccination. In 1860, there was no source of the vaccine, which must contain a live virus. It is usually uh, obtained from a, a scab from somebody that has been inoculated. Uh, because there was no commercial source, uh, it was found there, there weren't adequate supplies, and soldiers sometimes would inoculate themselves when they, they could find the case. One soldier inoculated 200 of his comrades. They later developed swollen arms and some rather unusual symptoms. When they checked into this, they found that he had obtained the material from a prostitute and he had inadvertently uh, infected 200 of his comrades with syphilis. Can you imagine some poor guy going home to his wife after the war and saying, honey, it wasn't from a toilet seat, I got it from a vaccination. Yellow fever is spread by Anopheles mosquito, but it has to be picked up from an active case. Again, it's got a mortality rate of 20%. New Orleans used to be devastated by it. But after the Union captured New Orleans, we established a quarantine, and there were no active cases during the war. There were a few small outbreaks. There was one uh, fairly significant one at Hilton Head Island, but uh, these were usually um, controlled pretty rapidly. Diarrhea killed 37,794 Union deaths, spread by a lack of sanitation because many soldiers were from rural areas and were used to relieving themselves behind the nearest bush. As you know, sand will, cl uh, will clean water, but only if it's fine enough and there's a sufficient distance between the privy and the water supply. Early in the war, privies were shallow and often located too near the water supply. 
later in the war with the advent of the sanitary commissions, uh, they, they made recommendations which were followed. The privies were dug to a depth of eight feet, and every night six inches of fresh soil would be put in. Uh, the first sanitation commission was started by William Olmsted, who designed New York's famous Central Park. Dorothea Dix, who helped establish the Instane Asylum System in the United States, was also instrumental in founding these. In 1864, she will help start the first Geneva Convention, which will regulate the care of the wounded and of all prisoners. A well usually cannot supply enough water for a thousand men, and water often had to be supplied from the nearest creek. Soldiers used to joke that their coffee tasted different when the cavalry watered their horses upstream. And <laughs> A friend of the cavalry will note that. Malaria was treated with quinine, which we had. It was not known it was carried by mosquitoes, but it was noted that it was more common in swampy areas, and that swamps were avoided as much as possible when locating the camp. Medications. Now, here's a Civil War apothecary kit. I'll ask you not really to handle this because the leather is 140 years old and it's very brittle. It contains a few very good medications and a lot of junk. About the same with our medications today. Now let's take a look at a Civil War rifle. Arguably, this is the best rifle of the, of the Civil War. It was made by Remington. Uh, they manufactured 200,000 of them, but it was late in the war and they were never issued. It is about a foot shorter than the star, standard Enfield or, or Springfield musket. It uh, is used a 58 caliber bullet. Dell will you pass out some of these. Uh, and also with a modern rifle bullet for comparison. Now the problem, as you can see, this is a muzzle loader. The uh, powder is poured in the barrel and followed by a bullet, which is pushed down. Percussion cap is put on the nipple down here. Now the problem with muzzle loaders is that the bullet doesn't seal the barrel completely and doesn't engage the rifling. With the Kentucky rifle, we avoided that by patching the bullet with a piece of cloth or with buckskin. But a Frenchman, Captain Minnie, developed a bullet, which we're being passed around right now. And if you'll take a look at these, you'll see that they have, it has a hollow base. So when the powder explodes, the base expands, sealing the barrel and engaging the rifling. These rifles are quite accurate. They were made without any electricity in those days, but the machinery was pretty good. It will place 10 shots in a 4-inch bullseye at 100 yards and 10 shots in a 9-inch bullseye at 200 yards. After 300 yards, the accuracy falls off. Uh, black powder is very, very filthy. Besides a cloud of white smoke, it leaves a thick residue in the barrel, makes it increasingly difficult to load. But the mini ball is smaller in diameter than the bore of the rifle and goes down rather easily. Now you'll notice one other thing, the bullet is of soft lead. Soft lead is a terrible thing in a bullet because it, for human beings because it expands. It causes fearsome wounds. If it hits a bone, the bone shatters, necessitating amputation. This is the, this is the bone saw. And for doing amputation, or today we would use scalpels and do things delicately, they used a glorified butcher knife because they wanted to go through everything very rapidly. A good surgeon could amputate an arm or a leg in two minutes flat. Now sometimes uh, when somebody is hit by a bullet, the bullet goes through. You see an entrance wound and an exit wound. But if the bullet is lodged in the body, you have to locate it. Easiest thing to do is stick in your dirty finger. Remember, we didn't wash our hands, no gloves, just dirty instruments, dirty hands, and wounds became infected. One of our ancestors, a fellow by the name of Neilton, uh, invented uh, this probe. Now you have to remember that actually it wasn't invented until 1895. So he developed this probe which has a ceramic ball on each end. When put into the wound, if it comes in contact with the lead, the lead will leave a mark on the, on the ceramic end. Our people were, were, ancestors were pretty clever people. Battlefield hospitals were horrible places with severed arms and legs piling up. Soldiers were screaming, but in terror, not in pain. Amputation wasn't performed without anesthesia or with whiskey and the soldier biting on a bullet. Chloroform and ether were always available. 
ether is still used today, usually combined with other agents. It has one bad property. It explodes when exposed to flame, such as you would find in a lantern. Therefore, chloroform became the drug of choice. It's remarkably safe. One of the early stages of inhalation anesthesia is called the excitement stage. During this stage, the patient will shout and will thrash around. With a trained anesthetist, uh, this stage is passed through so rapidly that it's hardly noticed. But with amateur and inexperienced soldiers given anesthesia, this will account for a lot of the horror stories about amputations. Uh, this, this is a letter from Dallas Tennant, the great uncle of Donna Will, who was killed at White House Landing on June 21, 1864. This letter was dated July 30th, 1863, right after Gettysburg. He says, you would be glad to hear from your brother Dallas once more. Since I wrote to you last, I have seen some hard fighting and done hard fighting. I have been in seven hard battles since I wrote to you last. I'll write down the battles where they were fought. The hardest fight we had was at Gettysburg, where we piled up the Rebs in windrows. They lost a great many men there, and so did we, but nothing in comparison to the loss to them. There were men killed in all shapes. I saw a cannonball strike a man just below the shoulders and cut him in two. I have seen men with their hands, arms, legs, and heads cut off. It was horrible to see the conditions. Some of the men in them that were, were wounded suffered terribly. I went to about one of the houses where I wounded were. Some of them lay on a bench where they had their legs and arms cut off. The blood was running through the bench onto the floor. It looked like a slaughterhouse. The blood was ankle deep. You don't know or realize the suffering uh, that are here in the army, especially in a time of battle. I have lain many a night on the battlefield without anything over me but the starry sky and the ground under me. Sometimes with rain pouring down in torrents, but it is to be and we must make the best of it if we can. I rode up to the enemy in line of battle and seen some of my friends shot down in other companies. We have not had a man in our company killed that we know of. But there are two men missing and we don't know whether they were shot or taken prisoners. They went on the field with us, but we have not seen them since. Let's take a look at a battlefield casualty. In the movies, he's a good-looking young man with a saber wound to his scalp. Remember, this is pretty rare. He's attended by a beautiful young nurse with a smudge of dirt on her cheek, but her hair and makeup are untouched. The reality, of course, is quite different. Attractive young women were not allowed. Only mature women were allowed as nurses, and then only if they were not too attractive. Again, let's get back to the reality. Don't get too close to this man because he stinks. Don't worry, so after 20 minutes your sense of smell will be paralyzed. Unfortunately, if you step back for 10 minutes, your sense of smell will return. Now you'll notice that he has his name on a note pinned to his back, giving his name so he could be identified if he was killed. Now this man was shot in the leg and would have bled to death if someone hadn't put a tourniquet on it. Unfortunately, a tourniquet cuts off all circulation, and if it isn't loosened periodically, gangrene will develop. So gangrene developed in this man's leg. Being severely wounded, he couldn't lower his britches. And after a day or two lying in the field, he will be malodorous, to say the least. Maggots will have started to develop in the wound. These will be carefully removed, further irritating traumatized tissue. Now, maggots are kind of interesting in a way. They, they don't harm tissue. They only eat dead tissue. So some, in Confederate camp in Chattanooga, the surgeons left the maggots in place. They don't harm living tissue, but as I said, only remove the dead. Union surgeons also remo always removed them. It was found that healing was better with the Confederates and there were fewer complications. This was noted and in World War I maggots were frequently used in treatment of wounds. In spite of all these horrors, a soldier shot in the arm or leg had only one chance in seven of dying. Abdominal wounds were a different matter. Mortality rate was 87 percent. Perforation of the small, the small intestine, 100 percent fatal. Dr. Francis Reynolds, a surgeon of the 88th New York, excised a ball near the spine of a colonel who had been shot and appeared to have been shot in the stomach. The colonel asked how long he might live, and Dr. Reynolds replied that men usually live no more than three days. Six weeks later, he met the colonel on the street in good health. The ball had hit a button on his coat and passed around his body under the skin. Dr. Reynolds, who had a sense of humor, told him, you should have died, and I wish you had to save the honor of my profession. Okay. Uh, and this concludes the biggest part of my talk. Is there anything that you should learn from this? Yes. You should learn that your mother was right when she told you to wash your hands after going to the bathroom. Frequently washing your hands and keeping your hands away from your face will do more to prevent colds and infections than all of the Esther C. ever made. And I wish I had listened to my mother and then I wouldn't have this cold. 
I'd like to close this talk with three real bad amputee puns. Let's, let's see if you're still paying attention. Okay. There was a soldier from Missouri who was shot in the elbow and had his arm amputated. This left him unarmed. Okay. They left the army shorthanded. Okay. This is bad. It gets worse. After the war, he went west and wound up in Nevada, near the future town of Las Vegas. He took up a life of crime and became Las Vegas' first one-armed bandit. <laughs> okay. So that concludes it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, you're welcome to come up and examine, handle any of these things, uh, except the apothecary kit. So that's it. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.